This is the Self Storage Podcast, where we share the knowledge and skills from the industry's leading investors, developers, and operators to help you launch and grow your self storage business. I'm your host, Scott Myers, and over the past 16 years, we have acquired, developed, converted, and syndicated over 2 million square feet of self storage nationwide with the help of my incredible team at selfstorageinvesting.com, who has helped thousands of people achieve greatness in self storage. Hey, Scott, welcome to the call. Hey, Scott, glad to be here. Well, thanks once again for taking time out of your busy schedule to spend some uh, time with us uh, today. And if you would, why don't you uh, kind of summarize all that and just fill in the gaps for us? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, kind of a good way to summarize it is, um, you know, a, a business guy that joined the military and kind of combining two of my passions here at Spartan with my love for business and my love for kind of military strategy and planning. And I kind of really found a good outlet to use kind of what I what I learned in my camouflage PJs on a, on a day-to-day <laughs> life here. And you know, still being in a reservist, I still get to learn like the really good stuff from planning and strategy and leadership from the military side of the house. And uh, I'm really fortunate to get a chance to apply it every day uh, here at Spartan. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, as they say, you, you, you are the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with. And, uh, and it's been very helpful and beneficial to be able to, to spend time with you at our mastermind, as, uh, as we mentioned on the intro and the approach that you take to that. And also just, uh, you know, off, off stage and, and outside of the mastermind. Um, the approach that you take to projects and project management, because that is your background. Uh, it's also your DNA and your training. That's you know, right. Uh, kind of helped me to take things uh, to a different level. So um, uh, I, I appreciate that trait in you. And that is uh, rubbed off on uh, myself and our organization. So um, we're glad to have you a part of it. I love being a part of it. I mean, the, the mastermind, I, like, it, it's funny. I, I booked my tickets to Tampa, mm-hmm. the next one coming up. And I, so somebody astutely pointed out that I've missed it by that much. <laughs> um, so I, I rebooked to Orlando, but I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really excited for the changes that you're rolling out this year and kind of expanding it and going a little bit deeper. I think that the folks that have signed up with your mastermind and, and those that are of interest to sign up for it are going to do very, very well this year uh, and even enhance their performance over past year. So I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of it. And you do a fantastic job putting it on. Yeah, well, well, thank you. And it, uh, you know, it, it, it takes two and uh, it takes a village to, to help these folks and, uh, and bring them along. But uh, we've, we've come a long way and appreciate that you being a part of that and all your input. And yeah, they, uh, uh, my, my word for the year, you know, I've got, you know, goals, plans and everything else I laid out, but the word for the year is really intentional. And so um, everything now is getting, um, you know, more of a focus and a, a you know, and a, a microscope lens put to it and making sure that uh, we're dotting all our eyes and crossing our keys even more so than we've done in the past. And I think we are going to see, uh, we're going to bear more fruit out of the mastermind as a result of that as well. Outstanding. I'm looking forward to this year. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, you know, the mastermind is all about deals and, uh, and matching up with a uh, capital. Tell us a little bit about, uh, you don't have to get into details about the deals that you're working on, but tell me, you know, kind of the types of deals that you're seeking and some of the deals that are being brought to you that, uh, that you're spending a lot of time on these days. Absolutely. I, you know, we're, Self storage is heyday. Some some are going to argue that it was in 2016, 2017. You know, we were a sleepy asset class kind of, you know, post, I should, I'm sorry, pre recession. And then, as, as you're well aware, and as, as a lot of your li- listeners are aware, it did very well through the recession. So it's a double edged sword. It's, a, it's good that it was stable, but it's bad that it was stable because then all, now all the big guys have seen it. And you know, we're, we're both experiencing the same thing. The, the, the low hanging fruit has been turned into, you know, pies. And now we're having to climb up the trees and into secondary and tertiary markets and mm-hmm. really kind of dig deep for those deals. So for us, we're slowing down a little bit on our acquisition side of the house, just because we're kind of late stage in the cycle. And there's a lot of money chasing the deals. But you know, really what we're, we're looking for, the value add plays and kind of secondary and tertiary markets, mm-hmm. we're looking for, you know, the 70 to 90,000 square foot um, kind of after renovation or after expansion type facility. So you know, we have some deals that are coming into us that are a little bit smaller. They're going from our direct mail campaign. And, mm-hmm. and we're working with uh, a folk in the mastermind right now to, to purchase one of those deals from us. So mm-hmm. that's kind of what we're looking for. And that's what we're seeing out there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, well, like any good investor or any good organization, you know, we have to look at market cycles and trends and keep an eye on not only where we are right now, but you know, making these predictions into the next quarter and into the next year. And, yep. um, you know, we invest based upon you know, economic cycles and uh, presidential election cycles, yeah. and, you know, trying to foresee what and forecast what's coming down the pike. And so that's caused us to, you know, thankfully we're in, a, in, a, in an opportunistic position right now where we're not forced to, we don't have to go out and kill something and drag it back to the cave. 
uh, that we can say no, or if a deal that you know may have looked good a few years ago doesn't look good now because of the you know, economic climate that we're hitting in, uh, you know, either way, it, um, it it gives us a great comfort to know that we can take a look at something and and, and still say no because we don't feel like we have to do every deal. And and I know um, last time you and I talked, uh, actually the past few times, um, you taking that same approach and that you're also looking at other asset classes. Um, you know, both of our background is in you know, homes and, and apartments and you've done some other things as well. So tell me a little bit about, are those um, opportunities that are coming to you? Are you seeking out um, other asset classes? And then, you know, how does that play into where we are in the economic climate that we're in right now? You know, that's, uh, we are, it's kind of a twofold strategy right now. Mm -hmm. So we do look at other assets. We've got some RV parks uh, that we do, and those are traditional RV parks. Those are not mobile home parks. So it's actually mm -hmm. people living in an RV. Uh, that there Clark is an RV, uh, just like <laughs> Mm -hmm. In the in the driveway of of Clark Griswolds and, and his cousin Eddie and that's mm -hmm. uh, the the RVs we have are a little nicer than cousin mm -hmm. Eddie but that's that's what we're talking about when we say RV parks mm -hmm. but we're also building a mobile home park in court and I should should say collaboration with another group up in uh, Washington mm -hmm. and we are going to introduce another asset class you know, we chose self storage for three evaluation criteria easy to manage mm -hmm. easy to operate mm -hmm. easy to evict. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the three things that yeah. are important for our investments. So there's some other invest there's some other investments out there that are pretty close to that. Storage is by far the best for mm -hmm. that one. But the RV park isn't far away from it. Yep. And we're assessing some other uh, asset classes as well. We're just being cautious that we have the team members to be able to do the due diligence and then operate them once we bring them on. So we're, yeah. we're treading a little bit carefully. I'm guessing that that third asset class will be identified and opened up and probably Q4 of 2020. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as they say, um, you know, everybody loves uh, to invest in real estate if it uh, weren't for the tenants and, and the toilets and, and the right. trash. And so, yeah, we came to that realization as well because, um, you know, it, it, as you just um, you know, elaborated on, and, and what I think you're drawing to the point is um, there is this unknown when you have tenants that um, can't be evicted or the process is very lengthy and expensive and we yep. don't necessarily have control over it. Uh, whereas in self-storage um, parking garages, parking lots, you know, we have a lot of control and there's a much, it's a, just a much more predictable business model um, than some of the other asset classes where we're really kind of going along, where we're kind of passengers to a degree in, in some of those income areas. Absolutely. And, and really nobody cares about granny's old chair. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the laws that are uh, kind of governing the contract between, I'll say landlord and tenant, just so that it reaches a larger audience are, are less stringent than there are in a, in a housing situation, whether it's mobile home parks, multifamily or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that to us, you know, one of our core values at Spartan is integrity. Mm -hmm. And we, when we enter into a contract with one of our tenants or residents, um, we, we agree to provide a clean, safe space to whether they're gonna park their RV, and in that we, we agree to provide them utilities, mm -hmm. or in the storage side of the house, a clean, secure space to store their belongings, and if we do that, then we expect to be paid for that. So mm -hmm. when folks don't, we, we don't necessarily want to be handcuffed by legislation to, to not be able right. to enforce that contract between us and our tenants. So mm -hmm. that's really why we look at the, the, that's why storage is by far the greatest. Now, mm -hmm. as you're well aware, storage wars doesn't happen. <laughs> There's never a midget on someone's <laughs> shoulders looking into the, the, the unit. And yeah. for the most part, it's not a profitable like process to go mm -hmm. through it, but it, but at least it gets us our unit back quicker. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, I think it, it, it was but a couple of weeks after uh, one of the shows in which somebody was using night vision goggles that one of our managers <laughs> said, hey, guess what I just saw for the first time ever at an auction? Yep. Night vision goggles. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Hilarious. Uh, so um, you, you're right. And once again, uh, I'm hitting on the points. And, and that is the reason why we love um, self-storage is um, you know, for, for that very reason is that we, you know, we can control that piece. And, you know, as investors, uh, it, you know, we uphold our, our end of the bargain and operating from a place of integrity and providing a service and is a clean and is a safe environment. And all we ask in return is that uh, people just obey the rules and that they pay the rent. And um, in the housing world, the habitational world, um, those laws are, are meant to protect those folks that are really bad actors. Um, Mm -hmm. But in self-storage, you know, the good guys, the, the investors, the ones that are doing things the right way, um, you know, we get rewarded and, and the, the laws are in our favor. And so that is what swung the pendulum for me and uh, moving all our assets over into, into self-storage. And you, and you owned and like operated multifamily. We've not done that. Yeah. So you, 
you you stared into the dragon's mouth by far more than we had. So I I applaud that, and I'm I'm sure that that kind of solidified the foundation of yeah, let's do something else. It did, and you know, at the end of the day, um, uh, it made a lot of money in in, in houses and in, in multifamily. Yep. But uh, and, and there's property management companies that that shoulder that burden, and and they contract. You know, the contractors take care of things, but. Uh, it's still disheartening to see how you can get taken advantage of uh, by your maintenance folks, uh, by your property managers, let alone the tenants and the, and the contractors and folks. In this. So there's just a lot of areas in which there's a, you know, a lot of margin for error. But uh, again, that, so I don't, I don't want to, uh, you know, alienate all, all the folks out there that are listening that, uh, that are big things, the habitational, you know, it just wasn't my, my cup of tea and not telling you to do what, uh, what I do, but, uh, and never say never, I may go back to uh, multifamily or doing uh, some houses or in some way, shape or form. But right now I'm pretty comfortable in, you know, in the lane that we're in right now. 100% with us, same thing. We, we like, some of the multifamily guys are doing a fantastic job out there and they provide awesome returns and they're, they're really good investments for folks. Mm-hmm. But just like you, that was just kind of something that we had made uh, the, those evaluation criteria and steered away from just kind of our, on our experience or yeah. kind of like what fit with our culture and values a little bit more. And mm-hmm. that's how... So you and I are having this conversation right now. Yeah. Well, so Scott, this is a question that I ask uh, uh, many folks. In some cases, I, I know that they've had um, a deal that has gone uh, bad in their past or a number of deals or even a year or two that went bad in their past. So, um, and I know that, uh, that this may not be the case for you because you are so regimented and diligent. Um, your, your due diligence is uh, far better than just about anybody that I've ever seen. But you know, tell us, take us back. Is there a time where you had you know, what you define as a failure in a, in a deal or in a business line or an asset class um, or a direction that your business was taking? And then what you learned from it coming out on the other end? Uh, great question. And even, even the best get it wrong occasionally. And it's, and it's funny, one of a I'm speaking at the ISS. We both are. Um, mm-hmm. And mine is on doing due diligence on a sponsor. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the, this is the, one of the key questions mm-hmm. I am recommending folks ask because there isn't a sponsor out there that hasn't had a deal gone bad mm-hmm. and you learn so much from it. Mm-hmm. We've never lost money on a deal, but there's one in particular, this was a condo conversion. So far our storage is, provi- is producing pretty well. Mm-hmm. We had a condo conversion that, um, it went longer than projected yep. and we missed our return. We were able to give some of a return, but it mm-hmm. wasn't what we projected. Mm-hmm. And we ended up working for free because we gave the investors everything, which sucks, but mm-hmm. that's what we have to do. Mm-hmm. And that one really kind of what, what had happened was we, we, got, we got over our tips a little bit mm-hmm. with what we thought the sales price would be. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were a little aggressive on that, that outgoing sales price, which in, if you take it out of the residential and you put it into the self storage or, or any commercial asset, you know, a key component is to watch that exit cap. Rate. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So small changes in that can make a big difference in that valuation price. So if you're an investor, just make sure your sponsor's not going like waving crazy exit cap rates out. If it's a storage deal that 10 years from now is going to be selling at a four cap, mm-hmm. you may have some issues. Mm-hmm. So, Unfortunately, we were a little over our tips with um, kind of our assessment of what we could sell these condos for. And then we just had massive problems with our contractor. Mm -hmm. Um, We had worked with him for years and then we had two projects on him. One of them, one of them turned out okay, by just like a sheer force of will. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we underestimated what we could sell them for. So, Mm -hmm. but it was a longer, but same contractor, but we'd worked with the guy for five years and then all of a sudden he just falls apart. Um, and, and we fought tooth and nail to get that project done. We brought in some additional help. We paid additional expenses. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we promised X return. We gave them X minus like X percent or whatever it was. And then it, it was supposed to take 12 months and it ended up taking 18 months. Mm-hmm. So that was one that we, we got over a little bit over our tips. And yeah, fortunately we chose a bad contractor, um, mm-hmm. on that one. Mm-hmm. Well, um, certainly there's a, there's obviously no question on uh, this end or any of our listeners as to the integrity that you have by, by doing that one for free and giving that back to your investors. Because if anybody is familiar with um, how this works, investing into a syndicate with a promoter and that um, 
I haven't seen an operating agreement out there that says that uh, the promoter has to give up the, their their share and their returns yep. in order to make their investors whole or get close to or you know match the IRR that they had in their projections, no matter how bad the thing goes. You know, typically it is, hey, there is risk and we're splitting the returns, the percentages are this. And if we miss the mark, then you know what? Mm, we projected an 18% and we came in at, at, at 16 or 15. Um, yeah. you know, I'm sorry, but this is what happened and hopefully you'll invest with us again. Uh, there's nothing to say that we have to give up more or all of ours to get them up to an 18%. So um, that, that, that speaks volumes about your integrity. And, um, you know, we, the decision is, uh, you know, made differently for all, all folks, but you know, yep. there's a lot at stake there. There's, there's doing the right thing by people and also realizing, and you know, if you want to call it on the selfish side, but we want to keep these investors investing in deals with us. And so I, I'm, I'm assuming as part of your, your talk with the ISS um, about vetting your sponsors, you know, there's a whole lot of folks that are putting their money blindly and, and trusting in sponsors that have not gone through the entire process of putting together a, a, a syndication raising the capital, buying a, a, a project and creating value in it, and then exiting and meeting their projections. You right. know? So, um, and, and I'd say there's probably more folks out there that fall into that camp than ones that you can invest with that have a track record and a history that have been doing this for five to seven years in a deal and you know beyond the recession to, to show that they bought at X, they created the value and they exited here. And, and here's how closely they met those projections uh, that they you know, put in place in the very beginning. So uh, that's just, just a key piece to that is, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, I'm, and I'm also shocked, if I could add one more thing to that, is that, you know, we do the same thing. And I'm shocked at the amount of people that don't do the due diligence on us. Yep. Um, they won't come meet us and they may not come meet us at the site. And you know, we always go to the site, obviously, several times and they'll never set foot on and uh, never shake our hands, look us in the eyes. Um, we, we do have a strong track record behind us, but um, at the end of the day, until they really dig into, you know, to the, to the numbers, they, they wouldn't know to the degree in which they do. So they'll watch a webinar or hear about us and get referred to us and, and, and write a check for some pretty large sums of money. And, I, and I'm still shocked that people do that to this day. 100%. We, we invite everybody here to our office in Golden and say, hey, come meet the team. And um, we, we get a fair split um, that do come and meet us. But we do get folks that just like you that, that have not met us and have not kicked the rocks on the sites, you know, regardless of where they are. And it, you're right. A big part of my presentation is about making sure that you've done your due diligence on your sponsor. Mm -hmm. There really shouldn't be anything that's off the table on the questions that you can ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know, we're in the very fortunate position that um, because of our education organization, we have a lot of deals that are brought to us, a lot of opportunities to land on, on our desk uh, without us having to do a lot of marketing and filling our funnel. Um, and, and I know your, your name is getting out there and, and you're having opportunities to partner with folks as well. But outside of that, your own mining, your own marketing, um, we don't expect you to give away the farm, but you know, where, where are you bearing fruit in some of your marketing techniques? And, and are you looking specifically for deals and then backing into a market? Or are you targeting some markets in which you want to invest in or maybe perhaps grow a portfolio where you already own a property? So one of the, one of the things that I'm grateful for is we have a business intelligence analyst Mm -hmm. that came from the special operations community in which she used some pretty sophisticated tools to do some pretty cool stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, <laughs> so we've, we've brought that person into our organization. Mm -hmm. I, I married that person. So mm -hmm. um, our, our HR strategy inside of Spartan is not exactly repeatable <laughs> outside of Spartan. Um, yeah. You know, and, but, uh, we, we, we've gone through and we've done um, a fundamental analysis on markets across the country mm -hmm. um, using some pretty cool analytical tools that we have here. And we've identified 31 states and 159 core-based statistical areas or census tracts mm -hmm. that have the market fundamentals that we are interested in. Mm -hmm. So we started market and then we we're looking for deals across those markets. And we're not doing anything special on that side. We do have a direct mail campaign and we're we spend probably sixty thousand dollars a year on data um, mm -hmm. to try to get some like, some better insight into those markets and some better information for those facilities that are within that market. Um, and we're kind of going at it as as a three pronged approach. We don't really look at much that's listed. Um, we are developing broker relationships. We've got an acquisitions team inside of here that's doing a fantastic job mm -hmm. uh, doing deals and and working with brokers, uh, mostly off market stuff. We Call for offers we're not really interested in. That's not really our game. Um, most of it's off market. And then our direct mail campaign has bared some fruit uh, mm -hmm. as well. So you know, we're using some of the traditional tools. I just think mm -hmm. we're 
we're getting some insight from the markets and the facilities inside that leveraging uh, expensive data systems to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so what you're saying is um, one strategy would not be to read last month's trade magazine to see who built where and then go visit and try to build something after them. That's what you're, is what you're telling us, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's probably, uh, you know, uh, I think that's called following the herd. Maybe <laughs> I've heard somewhere that that's a bad idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, so definitely, uh, you know, there's, I, there's some markets, you know, Denver, I, like we're here in Denver and this is a bloodbath of a market. All the REITs are here. Um, we're seeing facilities dropping prices left and right as the competition is really heating up here. Yeah. With all that said, though, there's, you know, self storage is a very, very kind of niche and nuanced, very local type of investment mm -hmm. such that, you know, maybe, maybe one corner and there's, you know, in an urban market like Denver, it can be, you know, one mile in Denver can be a 20 minute drive if mm -hmm. there's traffic. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. You know, there's, a, there's still opportunity, but you really, to, to, to thread the needle on, on saturated markets, you really have to have boots on the ground yeah. on knowledge to be able to do that. Otherwise, it's in, inherently more risky mm -hmm. to go into a market like Denver without having that boots on the ground. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it, we've talked about this before, you know, the, uh, the REITs, um, they're very sharp. They're very smart. They absolutely yep. know what they're doing. And we reverse engineer what they're doing at, at, at every, you know, every chance that we can um, to the degree that they'll, you know, open the kimono a little bit and allow us to. But it, we, uh, when they say that they're moving away, that uh, Denver is a flyover market and we're not doing anything in Denver um, when we're, you know, at the trade shows and then they get down off of the stage of the panel and then they begin talking to each other about the, the new project they're working on in that same market that they said is a fly, flyover. So, yep. uh, it, and it speaks to, as you just mentioned, you know, the self-storage market in general, and that is um, you can't really paint a broad brush stroke across an entire market because the market for a project, a self-storage facility is you know, five miles, you know, arguably three, you know, especially when you're in, a, in, a, in an urban environment, when you're closer to a, a downtown MSA. So to have boots on the ground, you know, anytime uh, the folks that say that they're not doing that, then either, well, fantastic, that means that they're they're trying to ward off competition and many people aren't looking and we still should be because there are projects out there that are in the path of progress or even infill locations that are for willing to do the heavy lifting on some of the more difficult deals that the REITs or the regional or national players wouldn't look at. There, there are still opportunities there to be able to do so, but uh, yes, tread, tread lightly and do your homework Absolutely. and keep an eye on the permits uh, coming down the pike to make sure that um, something didn't uh, just get uh, awarded um, while you're under contract with another piece of ground or a building to convert. Yep. And trust but verify. There's some, there's <laughs> yeah. some digital systems out there that mm -hmm. that provide pipeline data. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the digital systems are are just as good as the the information that's being fed into it. Mm -hmm. So my my I guess word of caution to all the listeners is don't just sign on to a system and be like, oh, there's three in the pipeline. Okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. Trust mm -hmm. but verify. Yeah. Make sure mm -hmm. you get into that zoning department and ask some tough questions with them. And right. they'll they'll mm -hmm. tell you. The mm -hmm. bureaucrats don't care. They'll show their information, right. but just right. Mm -hmm. follow up on, on the digital side, uh, digital assessment with some analog assessment mm -hmm. of using the good old telephone or walking in there in person. Yep. 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 Get them out there from uh, behind the scenes and say, Hey, I, I found everything on your site and I've got your brochure from the corner over there, but you know, can I chat with somebody for just a few minutes about a project yep. we've got? And that's all it takes typically. Yep. So Scott, you had, um, I mean, you touched several times uh, on the team that, uh, that you have built and, uh, and I've met most of the folks on your team and you're right, they are top notch. Um, and the analysts that you talked about, very pretty. That was a very good hire on your part. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, but outside of that, also a rock star in her field. Um, let, let's talk about the team and, you know, your, your organizational chart. You know, we've, we chat in, you know, the mastermind and our teachings about, you know, the ideal five person self storage company that people, you know, should aspire to, or at least uh, those roles and, and what that looks like in those different uh, areas. So uh, share a little bit, if you wouldn't mind, uh, just about your structure and the different you know, areas in your business where you have folks and, and what their specific focus is. Sure. So we have, we have more than five now. So now we're at 10 and growing. Um, mm -hmm. That doesn't include our managers, mm -hmm. but kind of our, our core mm -hmm. team is broken up into basically uh, an executive team. That's myself and Ryan, chief investment officer and chief executive officer. But then we have three directorates and that those directorates are acquisitions and finance. Mm -hmm. And that team is really, that's, that's the, the team that goes out there and finds the deals and then finance them from the debt side of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan handles all of our uh, investors as the chief investment officer. Um, so we have, that's the private equity side of the house. 
And then we have kind of a business intelligence team um, that does all of our research and analysis to support the acquisitions team and also support the, the executive team with market research and uh, understanding where we are in the cycle and just kind of creating predictive trends. And then we have our operations team and that's the team that really operates the facilities. And that team is broken down into projects and current operations. The projects team is really responsible for doing the capital projects that these value add facilities really require. Um, that's the project management and that's the construction management side of the house. And then the operations team is really managing the property managers here. And then also there's a, a marketing component of that uh, as well. So we, we have 10 people right now. Um, mm -hmm. I think to do that effectively, we're a little understaffed and we're looking to grow. And with the deals that we're bringing on, we are, we're adding staff. And you know, I think if you're, if you're doing the full spectrum, uh, if you're raising your own capital, if you're finding your own debt and you're operating your own facilities and you're doing your own projects, probably 10 to 15 people is what you need. Mm -hmm. But if you're part of your group and you have those core assets through your ecosystem mm -hmm. or the, the, the self sword Academy, uh, then, then you can leverage those other teams. Mm -hmm. That's how we're structured. Yeah. Good. Perfect. So I, I know you're a big fan of um, obviously processes and standard operating procedures, but you know, is there a central tool or tools that you use um, for everybody to communicate or whether it be a project management platform or Slack or you know, how do you get uh, the, the core team of 10 on the same page? Give us an idea and an insight into some of the tools and resources you're using to make sure that happens. So we, we have two right now and we're sunsetting one. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an analog tool, which is it's really simple. Every week we get together for an hour and we do a sync meeting. It, it sounds really, it sounds really simple, but it's one of those, it's, it's kind of a, a sacred cow um, inside of Spartan that you like, if you're going to miss a sync meeting, there better be a really darn good reason of why mm -hmm. you're going to miss it. And then secondly, we use Podio right now. So we built yeah. that in a custom system inside mm -hmm. and that really kind of helps us communicate. Um, we do use some subsystems within the group. Uh, acquisitions is using Salesforce. Mm -hmm. Project management is using Trello, but mm -hmm. we're also assessing a system right now called Hive. One mm -hmm. of our one of our strategic goals over the next three years is to create a shared consciousness mm -hmm. amongst the team. That it, it stems from Stanley McChrystal's team of teams, mm -hmm. where he basically he set up a shared consciousness in between all of his special operations teams in Iraq during the sur insurgency, the early days of it. And that's kind of really what we're looking at. We don't use Slack. Um, mm -hmm. I've used Slack. Some of our team members use Slack. So it's kind of like some of, some people love it. Some people hate it. We're trying to use Hive as kind of a one-stop shop and then mm -hmm. connect some of our other systems through APIs to Hive. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that yet. So we're, mm -hmm. that's one of them that's being tested and rolled out right now. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, we're, we're using Infusionsoft and have for years in our, our database of all of our clients across uh, the board. And um, Teamwork PM is our project management tool that we're using uh, right now. Um, yeah, looked at Podio um, as well. And uh, several of our the folks that I'm in another mastermind with that are really on the single family side and, and other yep. asset classes that have used that. And that, that's just, that's all they use. And, um, and, and I, I kind of talked about it and looked at it and, and I think it probably could work for what we do, but we, we landed on Teamwork PM. And then um, you know, we have, I'm trying to think of, well, the, the basic communication tool then uh, for the most part is um, still through Teamwork uh, PM. And then uh, we do have a level 10 meeting um, through Traction, which sounds yeah. a, a lot like a, you know, your meeting that nobody misses. So to make sure that we communicate and keep on track. And then, uh, you know, outside of that, it is, um, you know, a number of tools and resources for, you know, looking at the analysis side and, and one investor portal uh, that we use as well. And so as much as uh, we'd love to have everything in, in one place, um, as much as we tried in less silos, um, at the end yep. of the day, you still have to some tools, not, not everything. If you find one that does it all, uh, either a, it's not going to work the way you want, and you're going to have to move away from everything and, and put, um, different ones back in place. So I think it's best to get the, uh, the best of the best in each one of those areas and just realize you're going to have to have a few different systems that you're using. Yep. One of the key tools that we use for alignment of effort is we develop a strategic plan every three years and it lines and it, and it identifies goals and objectives and key results. We use the OKR, the objective key result methodology mm -hmm. um, that I think Google pioneered. I think that was, I think that's right. Um, that Google really pioneered. Mm -hmm. And within that strategic plan, we then break it down to operational plans that are based on an annual, uh, annual cycle that align resources with 
strategy. And those are then broken down into individual plans based on a quarterly basis that we call performance yep. enhancement plans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that really kind of gives people like if you're ever standing around and you don't know what to do, <laughs> it's very, very easy to kind of look back at yep. your performance enhancement plan that has objectives and key results at the individual level, yep. all the way up to the strategic level plans for our company that show like where the overall strategy is taking us over the next three mm -hmm. years. So I think that's, that's one of the kind of the key things that, you know, in the absence of this single system that, yeah. like you said, is either, it's either a really big pain or you got to write a really big check mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. to get it done. That has been probably one of the key kind of key defining things for us is to have that strategic plan there so that everybody kind of sees where we're going over the next couple of years. And then the operational plans that connect the overall strategy to everyday tactics. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think at the end of the day, Scott, no matter what you're using, um, uh, whether it's, I, I think it's OKI, is that right? OKRs. OKRs. Key results. Um, key performance indicators is what we have, yep. and, and all those are based upon, you know, in the traction system. I, I think um, the time span that you mentioned, I think, is spot on. Uh, many of these out there, we used to use uh, Gazelle's uh, Inc. through Vern Harnish. You know, setting up all these plans in the direction of the company, you know, you need to start having your core values and, you know, your mission statement, and, and we revisit that once a month. But in terms of you know setting goals and objectives, uh, some of these folks you know, they, you know fill in their their forms that are PDF forms. They want you to go out five and ten years, and I think I, I don't think I'm even going to address that. I can't even either dream or realize that you know our business um, or the economy is going to take us in a different direction. God's going to take us in a different direction. Something's going to happen. Uh, I think three years is that is that perfect piece to then take down into bite-sized chunks into one year objectives to measure. And then, yeah, your quarterly rocks and goals. Um, and then, yeah, the, you know, our scorecard with, you know, here's all the, the areas in which everybody's responsibility is. Here's what you're responsible for reporting each week on your level 10 meeting and then just report. Are, are you good? Uh, you know, are you getting traction? 100%. Are you behind? And if so, then let's discuss it. Otherwise, if you're good, let's, let's continue to move on forward. I a hundred percent agree with you. Mm -hmm. Well, in the time that we have left here, um, Scott, I want to be mindful of yours. Um, is there uh, maybe uh, some words of wisdom or share, if you would, that and, and perhaps even uh, the best book that uh, you've read recently or that you may be reading right now that you'd like to share with the folks out there? So I think, you know, uh, I like the Eisenhower quote, and I use it a lot, um, or a Eisenhower quote. And, and the quote is, in preparing for battle, I generally find that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Mm -hmm. Whenever we're going into deals and everything, you know, another, another military quote is no plan survives first contact, right? <laughs> we put together this fantastic plan, these amazing financials, and it's a spreadsheet that looks snazzy and it like dashes and dances in front of you. Mm -hmm. But when the, when, when the metal meets the meat out there and we start operating these facilities, it never works, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the process of planning mm -hmm. gives you that kind of situational awareness that you can develop multiple courses of action out there mm -hmm. that maybe maybe don't come to fruition maybe it's the 50 or 60 percent solution but it's a lot faster to, to to start at 50 or 60 percent than it is at zero mm -hmm. especially when problems happen so i agree i think that planning is so important and if it's investors looking to put their money with sponsors it's understanding the level of planning for sponsors and then sponsors if it's mm -hmm. taking money from investors you better be doing planning to the nth degree because mm -hmm. you're taking money from people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think my, a book, I read it last year, um, Ray Dalio's Principles. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a really good book for us. It's kind of, yeah. we've, we've had some of that stuff inside of our organization, but just seeing him collate all of those ideas in yeah. one place mm -hmm. um, was really kind of helpful for us to, to then take that and, you know, in, in, in combination with some other key books, really kind of put some, cultural infrastructure inside of our business, which has really helped us. Yeah. Yeah. Someday, um, if I decide to retire, um, uh, and I don't even know what that is, um, at this point, I, I may read some, uh, um, some fiction, uh, but right now my favorite nonfiction is, is biographies or, or books that are written, uh, by gentlemen and ladies you know, like Ray Dalio, who we can draw on their experiential wisdom because they've, they they've seen a lot and they continue to draw on that as they make decisions now and they continue to make good decisions based upon that and so to uh to read one of their books and to get a, at least a little glimpse into the insight that the, that they have to help me in my decision making process um i just i i'm fascinated by reading about uh, these folks that have just uh, got it right and uh and not out of luck but just you know they make some really you know 
incremental decisions all along the way, just good decisions throughout their, uh, their life and their investing career that we can draw on. hundred percent agree. Mm -hmm. Well, Scott, once again, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, looking forward uh, to seeing you at uh, the next uh, mastermind uh, as well. And so say hello to the team for me and um, hope to have you on here on another podcast in the future. Cause we just kind of scratched the surface here. Outstanding. Thanks Scott. I appreciate the invite. All right. Take care. You've been listening to the Self Storage Podcast, where self storage investors come to learn how to launch and scale their self storage business. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and of course, a five star rating would be much appreciated. And if you're looking to do an even deeper dive into the world of self storage, head on over to our sponsor, selfstorageinvesting.com, and check out their entire suite of resources from software, business plans, home study guides, live events, private money assistance, mentoring, and even how to apply to become a member of the Self Storage Mastermind. So head on over to selfstorageinvesting.com and pull down one of the free guides to get you started. And as always, we'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you.